doctor in the TARDIS. Next stop everywhere. Welcome back to Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the TARDIS. Well, still, you know, basement of solitude. You know how it goes. <laughs> but um, I'm here, obviously, with my fellow partner in time and uh, fellow birthday well-wisher, yes. Jesse Jackson. How you doing, Jesse? You know, I, I always forget that we're both Gemini's, yes. so we're both June birthdays. Um, yeah, so Charles, we're going old school today. So, so, we're, take, so take that, Gemini haters. That's right. So we're we're kicking it old school. It's just you and me. Exactly. No special companion today. Um, I wonder if that's because they knew what episode we were discussing and they um, said, boo, boo, boo. Maybe. <laughs> that's possible. I wouldn't... I know we have we have some very intelligent special guest companions, so I will not put that against them. That's but right. um, in case you wonder what we're talking about here at episode 188 of Next Stop Everywhere, uh, we are talking Attack of the Cybermen. This is from the Colin Baker era. So this is um, uh, the first serial from season 22 in 1985, uh, written by Paula Moore which was an alias or a pseudonym for Paula Woolsey and perhaps some other people, which I'll talk about in our trivia section a little bit, because there's a little bit of a controversy involving the writing credit for this story. And directed by Matthew Robinson, and of course starring Colin Baker as the Sixth Doctor, and Nicola Bryant as Perpigillium Perry Brown. And... Um, yeah, this one obviously is not one of the highlights from Colin Baker's era. Not that there are sadly many highlights from his um, TV era, although many, many highlights from his Big Finish era. And uh, so much so that even um, uh, this was one of the titles that I had suggested to um, Rachel Friend from the Five-ish Fangirls podcast. So hi, Rachel. Hope you're listening. And... Um, when we had her on the first time, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, she wasn't exactly jumping at this one, even though she's a huge Colin Baker fan. So that kind of should tell you something. If even his biggest fans aren't eager to talk about this one. So I do, before you get to your trivia, I'm going to give you my trivia. Yeah. I was lucky enough, um, a couple years ago. I think it was the year after the 50th anniversary. They had a small little Doctor Who convention here in the DFW area, and both um, uh, Colin and um, – I'm drawing a blank on Perry. Both uh, Nicola, were, Nicola, Nicola yeah, Bryant. Yeah, yeah, they were both uh, guests. Um, I got to hear them um, speak. There was some nice banter back and forth between them. Uh, it was – you know, I had not seen any of the classic episodes – at that time, so I didn't know much about her or him. Um, I also, I did get, um, there was a local artist there did a watercolor of her, and then I had her sign that, so that was nice. So, but she seemed, she was, she was very personal, very friendly, and the couple times I've met Colin Baker, because um, I was lucky enough to interview him once uh, at Comic Palooza. Great guy, absolutely friendly guy, and a big comic book fan. So um, I, so I kind of almost want to say good things about the episode because I like them so much. Well, you can like what they do in it. Yes, you know, there's just because you know it may not be a great story doesn't mean that you, um, 
have to, you know, you know, put down the actors. You know, maybe right. you like what they the way they maybe you like the way they made the best of a bad story. Yeah, absolutely. And we could talk about that. Although I will point out that this is pretty much how the universe works, people, in case you're not sure. Um, Jesse, who had never met Colin Baker or Nicola Bryant, uh, who had never seen any of their episodes, gets to meet them. While yours truly, who has been a Doctor Who fan since he was 14, yes, has watched all their episodes, mm-hmm. big fans, especially of, of yes. Nicola Bryant and uh, Colin Baker, and um, have never had the opportunity to meet either of them. And you know what's even sadder, Charles? So, universe shakes fist. Um, the the first year at Comic Palooza, um, the actor who played Jamie was there, and I did not go and talk to him because I didn't know who he was. And now that I'm like, damn it, Fraser Hines. I would love Fraser to talk to Fraser Hines. He was yeah. so amazing. Now I That's... didn't know. I did get to meet Fraser Hines and also Wendy Padbury who played Zoe. Mm-hmm. So, nice. and, and I have their autographs. They were lovely people. So, yes. and I even have a picture with them. So as I have posted hey. that I posted on our next stop everywhere page. So, uh, so that at least I have on you. Good. At least, so, but, um, but yeah, it's maybe one of these days you'll get to meet Jamie and maybe I'll get to meet Colin Baker and, and Nicola Bryant, hopefully. Absolutely. So, all right. Um, so uh, guest cast for this story um, before I, I want to afterwards and then I'll ask you what your general thoughts are on this story. Uh, so guest cast, um, we had Maurice Colburn as Gustav Litton. Yes, he has a first name named Gustav. Look it up. Uh, it's very, very um a very that's what that's a great Doctor Who trivia question. He previously appeared as Lytton in um, the Peter Davison era story Resurrection of the Daleks, and that's where he's introduced. And also those strange um, kind of policeman henchmen that he's got kind of working for him that don't say anything and they're kind of creepy, robotish kind of characters. Uh, that's where they first appear. And then we had Terry Malloy as Russell, and interestingly, um, he played Davros in that very same story. So um, so if you wanted to see what Davros looks like without his makeup, at least um, he appears here as Russell, the undercover cop, infiltrating Lytton's gang. And he was also in the stories as Davros, in, a, in addition to the Resurrection of the Daleks, he was in Revelation of the Daleks and Remembrance of the Daleks. And he's been in a bunch of big Finnish audios as Davros and some other characters as well. So um, uh, he's very good on big Finnish, um, okay. as you might imagine. He's had some great um, stories with various doctors as Davros. Um, he's just he's one of my favorites. He was uh, he was really the first Davros that I latched onto because of being a Peter Davison fan. So uh, anyway, I just thought that was cool. And then um, we also had Brian Glover as Griffiths, and he played a character named Andrews in the third Alien movie, Alien Cubed, as I like to call it. Uh, He was also in American Werewolf in London, which is a classic film. David Banks returns as the cyber leader after appearing in Earthshock and the Five Doctors as a cyber leader. And he also turns up in a later story. from the Sylvester McCoy era, it's Silver Nemesis. And then we had, he also played uh, Carl, uh, this kind of villainous character in the Doctor Who stage play, Doctor Who, The Ultimate Adventure, which at one point starred uh, John Pertwee and also starred uh, as the Doctor and then also starred Colin Baker as the Doctor. But um, while during um, a couple of performances, apparently John Pertwee fell ill and with David Banks as his understood study, he got to uh, debut his own doctor. Oh, interesting! In, in, in that stage play, so for a couple nights he got to play the doctor himself, which is which is pretty cool, I would think, because uh, sort of counts and probably does count now after um, the Timeless Child. Absolutely, uh, you could count him as a doctor. Um, Michael Kilgariff, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He played the cyber controller, the rather um, uh, stoutly cyber controller. And um, 
He uh, appeared previously in the Tomb of the Cybermen, which this story is sort of a sequel to. And then he also played the second Ogron in Frontier in Space from the John Pertwee era. He played the K-1 robot, the voice of the K-1 robot, in Tom Baker's first story, Robot. And he was also the character known as the General in The Dark Crystal from back in the day. And then we also had Faith Brown playing Flast. Those are the notable cast in this in this story. Um, so, Jesse, before we get into our trivia, uh, what's your general thoughts on this one? So, I think we've talked about this before. There is a I'm a big um, I, I'm a big P one of a local sports station called the Ticket, mm-hmm. and they, like many sports teams, do drops, <clears throat> and where it's pre recorded. Um, language or words and one of their favorite is boring if someone is in the middle of a story that they don't enjoy I kept thinking well, that sounds, that watching that sounds this, mature doesn't it <laughs> yes uh, well, hey, it's sports talk radio yeah um, it no said I there really right? wa- I really wanted to like the story yeah but it just did not seem to capture me I, I, I couldn't get my mind wrapped around what was going on i mean i kind of understand a little bit we've got the whole you know haley's comet and and this whole under you know under this story about you know the this world and the previous inhabitants but it just didn't it, it, like over the past two weeks, I was like, I really like the story. This one, I didn't care for the story very much. It, this was this was a little more like homework having to watch it. Okay, how about you? Well, you know, so it didn't it didn't connect that um, tell us this uh, the the you know it didn't connect to you after we talked the tomb of the Cybermen that did this that was the same planet from that story or didn't you remember? No, it, Okay, I did remember. Yeah. Uh, okay, I was just wondering. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't expect you to. Now, also, um, this uh, this story is one of the season of season twenty two, which is notable because they switched from their standard twenty two twenty three minute episode format to a full forty five minute format, which right. is kind of like how it is in the modern day, in the modern exactly. era. So, um, so what did you make of, of of that change? Did that the did that help or hurt? I know you said the story was boring. So, yeah, so, so, I, so um, did the did the the forty five minute format work for you? the The forty five minute um, format made this feel, you know, more modern because it's only a two, it's a regular two parter. Right. Um, I did find it interesting that because people were so not used to that, that some stations actually took the 45 minute episodes and broke it into 20, 25 minute episodes. So it would be the normal format, uh, which I thought was interesting where they would have made that point. Well, that might have been that might have been for time, because maybe they only had a half hour on the schedule for Doctor Who. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, I you know, it it just I. I felt like there, there either what and and this is going to be this is not fair, Charles. I'm saying this right now. There is there either was too much plot or not enough plot. Yeah, <laughs> it know? wasn't I a balance. Mean, yeah, and so either it was too complex that I, I couldn't get it in my mind, or there was not enough story to keep me after captivated. I don't know which it is, and um, so. I am um, I'm, I'm going to do my best to carry my heavy lifting, uh, you know, carry my load when we discuss the different topics. But just this was a I ended up watching the performances more than I did the story. OK. And especially our two leads performances. Well, then what, what I wanted to I mean, obviously, then we can you can focus on that because right. that, that's obviously what held your interest. Yes. All right. Um, now, how about you? Now, you've said that this wasn't a one of your favorites either. No, no, I find it a little. Um, it's just it's not a strong plot. Okay. Um, it, I mean, it's kind of a. I mean, the basic idea of this story is obviously the Cybermen decide, hey, we could change history so that Mondas doesn't get blown up. Yes. Like it was blown up in the Tenth Planet, and. Um, to do that, you know, so we're going to go through this whole big thing. We've gotten ourselves this, we've got a time ship that we can use. And, um, our plan is to like, okay, we're going to, we're going to use it. And, um, and, uh, as a, 
and have our we've got our base here on Telos, uh, where we were like had our tombs back in the day during the Patrick Troughton era. And so um, and then, of course, uh, we're going to our plan is that we're going to basically divert Halley's Comet into striking Earth. And if we get rid of Earth, well, hey, Earth can then not get rid of Mondas. So that's our plan. And um, obviously that doesn't, uh, you know, the doctor ends up figuring this out and uh, and saves the day. So that's your basic premise of this story. And I was very confused. And so we might get to this with your, yeah. your two when you get to your uh, subjects, yeah. you know, topics. But there's the whole characters that look like they're female but they've got big white mustaches you know well you they're know, aliens i so, understand yeah but they they, they, they yeah. were they they're played they were, they're played by women yes very weird voices yes um, the, the the cryons yeah yeah yes and and yeah. also and they have a rather fun a uh, big fondness for bubble wrap yes yes also um i find it interesting how talkative the cybermen are in this episode right. not robotic but like hello charles we must do this right away we ain't like not this robotic tone yeah but it's just like hey i'm just gonna well they're not, well they're like, not that uh, conversational but they are like you know like we must destroy the doctor, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, but, and, and then, and then that's kind of just the, a shtick really of kind of seventies, eighties Cybermen. Okay. I did not that, know that. That was just, that was just kind of, especially with David Banks, um, because, you know, his, his cyber leader, uh, was always this kind of like, you know, very demonstrative, Cyberman, you know, like okay. he was like, and, and you know, and, and he would make these kind of like very st stilted um, performances, vocal performances. So he would, you know, like, you know, we must destroy them or, you know, like we must capture this and, um, you know, or, you know, excellent. Then that was their and, big, that was their big catchphrase during the eighties, but way and, before Bill and Ted did it. And, and not the robotic, emotional very non-emotional no it's cold of the modern cybermen age yeah. right they actually yeah they actually had a little bit despite what they they talk about purging their emotions half the time they they have emotions and uh so it's they're very hypocritical in that sense so Absolutely. so i so i get the they the, they're they're kind of a contradiction 80 mm -hmm. cybermen are in particular um it's kind of like a, an acquired taste. It's not like, you know, obviously, um, you know, we, when we first met them in the, in the, the 10th planet, they kind of had these sing song voices, you know, that, you know, and um, that would kind of go up and down and register. And then, uh, you know, you've had, you know, like, like the David Tennant eras, you know, they, they had a, you know, delete and, and they're not very vocal. And um, they they have a kind of a limited vocabulary, so um, so it's just kind of each area has kind of had their own spin on it, and it just so happens, yeah, the the eighty Cybermen, yeah, they 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 are a, a bit contradictory in nature, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, in general, yeah, th this is this story is not one of my favorites. I think it kind of, um, you know, it. <sighs> It, it it's like it wants to have it a, a it has like a couple of good ideas but then it throws in things like the the two prisoners that are trying just to get off Telos and their story ultimately ends up going nowhere because ultimately they just they finally you know um they get with Litton's guy and um uh Griffiths and, you know, they make it all the way to getting the ship to escape off of Telos, and then they get killed. So what was the whole point, apart from just having to fill up the time? So there's just a lot of things like that. Um, you know, the doctor's locked up for a good portion. Um, Perry, poor Perry's kind of stuck with the cryon, other cryons for a little bit. And uh, there's not really a whole lot, lot going on once they get to Telos. And... And I guess the the big until, reveal until the big be, until the end, yeah. When it's like yeah. all at once. Yeah, the big reveal, right, is that Lytton, Lytton wasn't yeah. Nessie Lytton actually wasn't 
the villain. Yes. That, you know, and, and I didn't feel they earned that. But now then I didn't know him from the earlier episode. Right. And so maybe that's why. But it, it, it wasn't a very big payoff for me. Yeah, I understand. Um, I understand because we, we haven't talked Resurrection of the Daleks yet. Yeah. And so I kind of, um, you know, I was a little concerned about that, that you might not, you know, because you didn't, um, weren't introduced to Lytton, um, him showing up and going, well, hey, you know, yeah, I met the doctor before and I know it was kind of a dick then, but. Um, you know, and then he gets revealed like, oh, he was working for the cryons all along. And mm -hmm. so maybe he wasn't a bad guy. Now, you do kind of get enough, I think, to come from the doctor's perspective, like he says at the end of the story, um, that he he thought Linton was a bad guy, but he misjudged him. Yes. And, you know, and he kind of regrets that he misjudged Linton and failed to rescue him. So um, then we'll talk about that a little bit. All right. Um, general trivia this time. Like I, uh, the only thing I have is that obviously I was talking earlier about the Paula Moore controversy about uh, who Paula Moore is, and uh, because it is a pseudonym, um, and apparently there's a, there's several different accounts of this story. So um, so basically, what it is, it's kind of conflicting information, and that's what kind of makes it a little bit of a controversy here. So. Um, in one account, uh, well, apparently most most of the accounts kind of agree that um, Ian Levine, who is this big kind of Doctor Who super fan, that um, that helped uh, rescue some of the tapes, you know, the, from the from the BBC archive purge, um, and he was kind of also a continuity advisor to the show. He suggested a number of plot elements for this story, and. Then in like one version of what who of who wrote this story, um, it was suggested that apparently it was written by uh, then script editor Eric Saward with or without additional input from Levine and Woolsey, Paula Woolsey, um, apparently was only acting as the script's author because uh, to head off problems with the Writers Guild of Great Britain who didn't like um, script editors um, acting as writers. Like they kind of like to keep those roles separate. Okay. So, so there was this kind of a thing. So the question is whether Sawar just kind of used Paula Woolsey as a way to write the script and not have it become a problem with, with the guild. And then another version of this story suggests that Woolsey originated the story, but then Saward um, heavily rewrote it as script editor. And meanwhile, you've got Ian Levine who says that Eric Saward wrote the dialogue to his story, Levine's story, and the plot, and that Woolsey didn't even write one single word of the script, according to him. So the truth is in there somewhere. Right. Um, but the question is, does anybody really care enough to figure it out yeah. at this point? Um, because it's not that great of a story. So I don't know why everybody would be like, well, yeah, I wrote it. I wrote it. So, yeah. you know, I'm not, I don't get the whole like rush to like claim this one personally. That's just Absolutely. me. All right. I get it. All right. Um, so we have three topics I want to talk about. Uh, topic number one, let's talk about the sixth doctor and Perry. And let's also talk about the TARDIS. Because, hey, at long last, the doctor fixes the chameleon circuit, sort of. So um, uh, I have to think that at least uh, held your interest a little bit. So, it, it, so, so, so let's talk about that first and foremost while I'm, I'm bringing it up. Yeah, so the first question is why? Why now? Why, why? Why did it take so long? Or why is he? Or just... why? Why is he now decided that? Okay, now he does. He, he acknowledges that. He goes, I don't know why I've waited so long to do this. Right. Uh, though now, it's, now, other... it's, now it's a new incarnation. Yes. Like because this is only his Colin Baker's second story, right yeah. after the Twin Dilemma. Mm -hmm. So he's still kind of new in this incarnation. So maybe he figures, well, it's a brand new incarnation. Um, the other five didn't do anything about it. So maybe I will. 
Yeah, and and he acknowledges that. He says, I don't know why I've waited so long. Um, and, and I can imagine, you know, Doctor Who fandom at the time would be thrilled. Like, oh, yeah, he's going to fix the chameleon secret circuit. Oh, this is great. Right. And, of course, it, it comes back where it isn't permanent, which is probably the way it should be. Right. I mean, we want that iconic look of uh, the police box. But um, it basically made for a few visual gags throughout the story. Yes. So, what, so yeah. what, did, what did you make of all those different versions, like um, the the kind of church organ and the um, the dresser and all kinds of the others? What did you what did you make of that? So it made me. And this is not fair, Charles. Yeah. But it made me think that sexy was having a little bit of fun with the doctor. Okay. Like she was uh, like it, like tardis. he didn't like he didn't really fix the chameleon circuit. Yes. Like the that um, or she doesn't like having the chameleon circuit fixed. Right. And so therefore she even though he thought he was fixing it, she's going to make it turn into all these strange things. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, it. So you think it was the TARDIS messing with him? Yes. And and I do I do love that that is a consistent um, no matter which doctor you're dealing with, the companion. Do you really know how to fly this thing? Are you sure you can get us where we're supposed to go? Right. I, I do. I have to take a moment, Charles, and you will appreciate this. Yeah. And this is actually on topic. OK. OK. So, um, you know, I started a new job in February and uh, one of the guys I work with, John, had came to me and said, you know, you're a big Doctor Who fan. You know, how do I start? What do I do? And so I sent him some episodes, and he came back and said, they're not on Amazon Prime anymore. I said, oh, I guess they're not. Well, he got HBO Plus. HBO Max. And HBO Max, yes. Yeah, and so yeah. he said, all right, Jesse, I'm ready to go. What do I do? And I go, you know what? If you're serious, start with Rose and just go. He says, all right, I will. So he came to me and said, so – the doctor doesn't understand between 17 uh, minutes and 17 months or whatever, you know, one of the scenes. Yeah. And I said, well, to be fair, if you're a time lord and you're over 900 years old, time could get a little timey-wimey and, you know, you would have a warped sense. Yeah. Um, and he said – and he doesn't seem to be able to control the TARDIS. And I said, well, there is an episode coming up that is a famous episode where Neil Gaiman, a famous writer, has the this wife, line. Yeah, yeah. yeah, where it says, you didn't always take me where I wanted to go. And the TARDIS says, but I always took you where you needed to go. And he went, oh, that's interesting. And I said, yes, all us Doctor Who fans pumped. I said, so as you're watching – um, think that in mind so he just finished watching dalek yeah and he's, he's like he's really enjoying it so so now he's hooked he is hooked all right yeah so uh so I, the, my next the, step is, that's is the I'm happy gonna, ending to the story yeah yes yeah, so the next step is i might have to have john join us one time as a special <laughs> and so anyway Sounds good. uh yeah so but to talk about the tardis and the chameleon circuit and in the doctor not being able to control it i honestly believe that the tardis is like no i don't want my chameleon circuit to be fixed i'm happy doing this and uh so i'm going to make it so um i I am. It's like when your your misbehaving children do follow you by the letter of the law, but make it so that you are so unhappy right. the way they did that. So I, that's how I thought. What do you think about that? Well, you know, now that you bring it up, the way you, you know you put up a good good argument, I think. Um, I could my my version of that. You know, like I like to take what you you just said, mm -hmm. and then. How about if the TARDIS um, didn't want the doctor tinkering? So the TARDIS decides, well, okay, I'm going to change into this, and then I'm going to change into this, and change into that, and then you're going to be so annoyed, and then you're going to be like, that's it. I'm not messing with this ever again. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, it's perfect. Yes. Yeah, so. 
So with the, I mean, that's obviously just the the fanfic here, but yes, that's yeah. okay. That's, that's what we do here. This is this is our own like uh, collective mm-hmm. collective fan head cannon. Yes, shall we say? But um, but, uh, but it did make for some great visual gags, especially yes. where like they're trying to figure out how to get inside, and uh, you know, like there's a you know, like there's a great scene where um, you know, like after the with the with the or, the organ, and you know, like they're looking around, and then. Uh, the sixth doctor kind of walks by behind, and Perry's kind of lo- still looking around the front. And he, uh, the sixth doctor outstretches his arm and kind of points this way, doink doink. Yeah. And um, and she goes back there, and uh, it just it is it, it had a li- it had a little bit of charm, I thought, to that. There also was a really nice not only sight but audio gag is he actually plays the organ and he yep. plays a little bit of classical music yeah. uh, from there. Um, it is just almost unwatchable to see that outfit. <laughs> it, it, I mean, you, it, it, I, is it so distracting? It is just so distracting. So, so if I hold up my Colin Baker action figure, are you, <laughs> are you, are you distracted? Um, you know, and he said, that he really wanted to look like Eccleston. Yes. That that was the, his whole The all he, black the all black, yes. Yeah. And uh it's just hideous. Yeah. Um and it is Well that's John Nathan Turner right there. Yes. In a it is. Yes. Right. Um it the ba- the doctor himself is actually um a little bit of a jerk. But also confident. Just, just, just a little bit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There, there is a lot of self confidence in him. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I liked seeing that part of it. Um, and he's finally stopped strangling his companion. So, hooray for that. Yes, I remember that. From the twin um, dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. Perry's a little whiny. Yes. Not totally whiny, but yeah. enough. Yeah. And, um, and, and I'm sure. Um, and again, Nicola that's up. Bryan. That's that's up to the writing there too. Yes, yes. It, oh, this is all writing. Yes, this is not the acting whatsoever. And I'm sure Nicola Bryant often said, "And really, do you have to have my blouses that low cut every episode?" <laughs> um, I mean, and she is a beautiful woman, but I'm sure she's like, "Really?" So, um, well, you know, she did actually. If you remember, you know, when they were in on. In uh, the um, those those underground tombs, if you will, the you know the where the cryons were on Telos, you know yeah. the, when it was being colder, she actually had a different outfit, you yes, know, she did. and you know the red that red outfit where right. where you know she was actually able to kind of button up a little bit. So Absolutely. so I'm sure that probably made for a refreshing change. I'm I'm guessing. Absolutely. Um. Yeah. All right. Now, what are your feelings on – and and one of the things you've mentioned over and over again, and, yeah. and Colin Baker made the same thing when he was talking about Big Finish audios at that convention, that they had given him a chance to really almost redeem his reputation as a doctor, and, and which is after Big Finish audios, he is – often he is ranked much higher – as a doctor than he would have been before that. So what are your thoughts on him as the doctor? Well, coming out, uh, coming off of t- the twin dilemma, because um, I, my, my first watching this was chronologically. Okay. So, so I watched the twin dilemma first and then, then this story. And obviously compared to the twin dilemma, his doctor is much better. Um, not just because he's not strangling Perry, but, um, you know, like he has a little bit of humor to him. He's not just, you know, this big emotional roller coaster that he was in the Twin Dilemma coming off of that, you know, that post regeneration. Um, you know, he still has those, you know, he still can get um, emotional, you know, you know, like that whole you know, like outraged, outraged, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's it's not as frequent so it's a little, it's more tolerable. And, you know, he does have, like, he has this playful moments, like, like the scene where, um, you know, he, the, he has that little fight underground off camera with uh, one of those um, policemen, 
you know, the Lytton's police henchman guys. And, um, you know, he comes out of, of that, of that hole and he's wearing the, the police Bobby, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Bobby's hat, you know, the, you know, that kind of, uh, cone like helmet they have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he comes so it's essentially the doctor, um, his love of hats coming through. Yeah, it's almost like I wear a Bobby like it, hat now. Instead yeah. of a fez, I wear a Bobby hat. Exactly. Now. You could see you could see Matt Smith doing that rather easily. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. So so you know, and if and I think if Colin's doctor had more of that mm -hmm. and less of the shouty. Yes, I think uh, so too. Um and less of, you know, just the, the bickering with Perry that um Eric's award seemed to love so much. Um, I think his reign, his era would have been much more well received, in my opinion. Yes. And then and, go ahead. No, and I, you know, and friend of the show, you know, yeah. Ken Schaefer, and that's kind of what Big Finish did. Yeah. So and exactly, and you know, like Ken talked about when we were, I was just becoming a fan of how disliked Colin Baker was in right. the role. And how that just in a lot of places, a lot of fans just really hated what he did. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of so, like like now you get a lot of Jody Whittaker people going after Jody. Yes. But just a, like it was even worse with Colin Baker back in the day. Yes. So, but unf and, and unfairly to Colin because you know I think he, so too. He wasn't writing the scripts, you know. And he, yeah. He was just paid to say the lines and, and do the performance. So he tried to bring as much, you know, as do what he could with the material. It's just the material was given was so poor. And that's why it was such a breath of fresh air when Big Finish um, did what they did. And like I said, uh, you know, I've talked about this numerous times that they helped redeem his doctor. I, they absolutely did. So, yeah. And um, but it's um, one other thing I, le I, I liked about the, the Dr. and Perry in the story. Um, at the beginning, you know, they, 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 they travel, they trace the signal back to earth and where of all places do they land? Number 76 totters lane, which, you know, I know we haven't talked on an earthly child, you know, the very first doctor who story on this podcast yet, yes. you will, but I'm saving it for a very special occasion. Um, okay. That, um, but, uh, you know, it's, this is the, this is where it all started, you know, that, 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 you know, this is where the doctor, um, you know, took off from earth with Ian, Barbara and Susan from 76 Totters Lane, that junkyard and, and as the, in, in his first incarnation. So it was a, it was a very nice touch to have, uh, the sixth doctor return to that very same site. I, I wondered if that was it, yes. and I'm so glad you brought it up because every time I see like a salvage yard or yes. something in there, I wonder, oh, is it the same one? Yes. Is this a, is this supposed to be a callback? And that's very cool that it was. Yeah, usually if you see it like a sign or something that says 76 Totters Lane, that's it. But um, but yeah, that's 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 where it all started. So um, it was kind of nice, and you know, notice his doctor doesn't like it doesn't click for him at first. Until Perry notices the sign, and then you know she says, "Hey, doctor, check this out, seventy six Totters Lane." And he goes, "Ah, you know, he gets that little bit of re realization, like, oh, this is it's it's that address, so that's where we've landed." And, another another thing I like, Charles, yeah. is um, they're still showing the regeneration. He he misspeaks. He he says some different things. He calls her the wrong name. Wrong I companion. Thought that was, yeah, the called yeah. her by the other companion name. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a nice little moment to show you that, um, you he's, know, in the terms of modern, he's still cooking. He's still cooking. Yeah, exactly. Just watched that episode last night, by the way, for my birthday. Nice. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we we had a little. Um, I was over at my parents and with my wife Lori, and we watched, um, you know, the eleventh hour and. and uh, my parents weren't overly impressed with it, but hey, it was my birthday, so I got to do what I want. And there you go. And so, uh, so I got to watch that, and I was I was enjoying it quite a bit. Um, but uh, you know, Perry, um, I felt you know, like she she has some nice scenes where she's kind of like walking around with the doctor in London, and then um, 
you know, and then, you know, once we get, they get to tell us, she kind of gets kind of shuffled off to the side. And ultimately she, she's there with the cryons and we'll talk about the cryons here shortly, but, uh, you know, they're being a little too touchy feely and in a creepy way, but, um, but, uh, she doesn't really get to do all that much apart from being intimidated by the Cybermen once they board the TARDIS and threaten you know, with execution. So it's just, um, it's just, unfortunately the, the writers and I, th- I really fully put the blame on Eric's award for this is that, um, Perry's underwritten and underused. And, um, it's a, it's a bit, it's a bit of a waste in my opinion. And also the doctor is a lot more, I get I, I did, violent is the wrong word, but yeah. he's using weapons. He's attacking people. Yeah, he is a little more physical. Um, physical. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you know, he, like I talked, we talked about you know he did have that underground fight that we didn't get to see. Presumably, he used some Venusian Aikido. That would have been nice to see. Uh, nice, you know, callback yes, to John Pertwee, been. but we don't get to see it, and um, that. Um, you know, and Perry, uh, she ends up having to hold a gun. And so she did get to do that at least, but, you know, and, and threaten the undercover policeman, um, Russell. Um, and there's that moment where, where, um, the doctor tells Perry to shoot Russell because he wasn't giving them information. And Perry's kind of surprised by this. She's kind of like, really, you want me to shoot him? And then she goes like, okay. And she kind of aims like she's going to fire. Now, do you think that was a little weird? Now, did you think she was in on that bluff? Because it didn't seem to me like she, like, it seemed like she honestly thought the doctor wanted her to shoot Russell. I agree with you. It did not look like she was buying the bluff. It looked like she's like, okay, whatever I'm supposed to do, you tell me. Right. So that was a little weird. Now, now obviously, I'm guessing the doctor didn't let Perry in on it because um, Perry might have given it away, perhaps. Sure. So, um, but it just seemed like, why, why is Perry so like eager to go along with this if she's not in on it? Well, and he's also very, very... The doctor always plays it very close to the yeah. vest, no matter yeah. which doctor it is. Well, so and, that, and, and this one is so mercurial. Yes. Yeah, that um, you know, and very unpredictable. So um, yeah. I guess that's kind of um, where that his doctor, Colin's doctor, kind of comes through here. Is that yeah. he's you know he's and he's still like you said he's still cooking he's still figuring himself out. Right. Uh, most doctors had kind of settled in by the second episode by the second story. Right. But um not not this doctor, not particularly. No. Yeah. Um uh, anything else? Um uh, now I did um did talk about this a little bit that the, the the doctor um you know we we talked about him being much more physical in this one. Now there was a this one's this story was kind of criticized for being a little too over the top violence back in I the can, 80s. Yes, I can um, see that. And you know there's that big climactic scene and at the end of the story where the doctor and, and Perry, they, they travel to the conversion center mm-hmm. at the end of the story to save Lytton. And then they, the, you know, the doctor gets into this scrap with the cyber controller and a couple of other cybermen. And he like uses one of the cybermen's weapons. Yes, he does to kill some of them. Um, so what did you make of that? That the doctor That's... using a gun. That was specifically what I was talking about, Charles. So I'm so glad you got the specifics. Yeah. Is yeah, that's unsettling. I mean, that is not That's not the doctor uh, you know. That isn't the doctor I know whatsoever. Right. And once again, that's purely on writing. Right. Um and I don't think um I actually think that the way the doctor values life um, that's very uncharacteristic in my perspective from him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, it's, you know, the doctor would have found it should have found another way. I agree. And um, it, it's very unsettling. And, you know, it's thankfully we don't get to see a lot of that from Colin's doctor. Um, yeah. But uh, but the, but it, it was it was a very, you know, you know, unsettling moment. 
I think, mm-hmm. for a lot of Doctor Who fans. And I think it's one of the things that um, helped turn some fans against Colin's Doctor. Yeah, I think so. So it's just, again, it's poor writing. And yeah. with Eric's award being the script editor, I kind of hold him primarily responsible here because he's yeah. the, supposed to be the guy overseeing that. And he yes. should be the guy saying, no, we shouldn't be doing this. Yes. But uh, there we go. All right. Uh, anything else about the Sixth Doctor and Perry? Nope. All right. Moving on. Topic number two. Let's talk about Lytton. Um, is he a bad guy? Is he a good guy? Or somewhere in that gray area? Let's talk about Griffiths, uh, his henchman, um, the one that ends up going to tell us with him. And let's talk about Russell, the undercover policeman, who um, kind of, you know, like he's intending to infiltrate uh, Lytton's gang and then ends up um, coming along for the ride in a time machine. So um, he's had an inter- interesting day, to say the least. So uh, what did you make of these three characters? So at first I thought it was interesting that the idea they're going to do this bank robbery, um, you know, I don't know what the story is going to be about. I, I'm kind of a little bit engaged with that. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know kind of it, – it they kind of lost my interest when – um, you know, cause you aren't sure what, um, you know, what was the purpose of this? What were they doing? Um, so I, I, they lost me. And then when you go, they're going out to space and going yes. to visit the planet. Tell um, us. Yeah. Yeah. I got kind of confused about like, okay, where, where are we connecting with this again? How did this, how does this, how does this go with the Halley's Comet? being uh, moved around it it just i i did not connect the dots and kind of like okay i'm just rolling with it yeah <laughs> so well i mean you know it, it, you know it starts off i think what it was it was just to to kind of throw you off a little bit like hey okay here's these bad guys they're planning a heist so um so where does that lead us and it kind of leads us in this unexpected place well that Okay, you start off thinking, well, okay, these guys are trying to um, do this 10 million pound diamond raid. And actually, basically what it was is that Lytton's supposed to be bringing recruits to tell us these criminals. Okay. And so um, to help them in the, in the, with the cryons in their war against the Cybermen. But it just seemed like, um, cause you know, it's, it's, I mean, on one hand, I can kind of see Lytton going, well, you know, it's not like I could openly recruit and go like, hey, you want to help me fight a bunch of alien monsters? Right. So basically what he's doing, he's just kind of like shanghaiing or, you know, kidnapping. Yeah. Use a, you know, a better term. Um, he's kidnapping them to to do this. And he's kind of like, um, well, you know, uh, this is what we're doing. Um you know, and he's kind of playing both sides a little bit between the Cybermen and the Cryons, um, but ultimately working for the Cryons. And um, ultimately that, uh, you know, that, it, it, you know, that the intention is that, you know, these other guys would help him and help the Cryons in their fight. So I think that was the ultimate goal there. Oh, okay. That, I, I get that. I yeah. can see that. Yeah, because, uh, it's, yeah, it's. Who else you get to recruit? You know, it's it's mm-hmm. maybe he was feeling a little desperate. I don't know, but you know they, yeah. that they maybe he thought that these criminals had a particular set of skills, yeah, and yeah. Um, that they um, needed to uh, that would help them with the what the particular mission on Telos. And, and did you remember, um, you know, Coburn before? Did you remember this character? Oh well, I, I remember Lytton on you know in, yeah, Lytton, in, yeah yeah I remember Lytton in the um, in Resurrection of the Daleks. Okay, so, so so but he was he was primarily a bad guy there. So okay. and you know and I think that was kind of the point was that you have this bad guy and he makes his return and you think well this guy is going to be up to no good, right? And that's the expectation. So then when the twist comes along that oh hey he was working to help out the Cryons all along. Mm-hmm. And and it also kind of makes the the doctor kind of look do a second look and go like, well, maybe he's more than I thought he was, and maybe yeah. I misjudged him. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of that regret. So I think it 
in one way, it's kind of like a l good little character moment for the doctor, although it happens so quickly and right at the very end. Yes. It doesn't have the weight that it probably should have. Yeah, I, I didn't feel like it did. No, because so, yeah. there's, like, there's this whole big, you know, the doctors are going around killing Cybermen and, you know, and Litton's there. Poor Litton, he ends up, you know, that's one of the things that happens in the story is that he's brought back to the conversion center and half turned into a Cyberman. He's converted, or, you know, and he, and he talks about how the drugs are affecting his mind. So he's just begging the doctor to kill him, which is not in the doctor's nature. Right. And, um... You know, that uh, ultimately he gives his life, you know, to fight fighting the Severmen. And and the doctor realizing, you know, like only at the very end, oh, hey, uh, you're not what I expected. So, yeah. And, you know, and, and it just doesn't really it just seems like, well, that key, you kind of came to that realization a little late in the story, didn't you? <laughs> yep. Too little too late there, doctor. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no um, way to there's not enough time because it's right at the very end to really give that moment the weight that it needs, you know, absolutely the, the beats, the story beats that it needs to, um, to feel something. Got it. And have it weigh on the doctor. I think Yeah. now, if they had picked up the next story in vengeance on Varos with the doctor still feeling a little troubled by it, mm -hmm. that might've been something, you know, that, that still like he still bothered him. So that that would have given it a little bit more weight, I thought. But just a throw has a throwaway thing at the very end. Just seemed rather anticlimactic to me. Got it. Yeah. Good. So, all, all right. right. Um, anything else about Litton or okay? Not for me. All right. Um, what did you think of Russell the undercover cop? Does it was that a surprise? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, but once again, I don't feel like it had a payoff. Yeah. No, um, I agree, but yeah, I mean that's it, it, his his story kind of fizzles out. Yes, what, and and you know, and I, I um, and you're going to talk about it, I assume, but like the two people trying to escape, yeah, um, you know, like where did that come from? Where yeah. did that go? You know, that was we might as well talk about them because yeah, I hated that subplot because yeah. it it served absolutely no purpose because all they do is they end up getting killed anyway. So, yeah. so, so these two guys who have been partially converted, and apparently we're told that, um, you know, not every conversion succeeds. So these are basically reject right. Cybermen, and yeah. so they're put to work on this chain gang mm -hmm. for the Cybermen. Apparently, just pounding sand, or you know, pounding yeah. rock for the Cybermen on Telos for no whatever reason, and yeah. and you know, we don't even know what they're really digging for doing there. And then, so they're trying to make their escape. Okay, we get it. They're prisoners. They're trying to escape. But one's a complete bumbling idiot. And yeah. uh, the other just keeps yelling at him through the whole time. So you don't really like these characters. You're not invested in their escape at all. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when they finally do escape, um, they end up getting killed anyway. So what was the purpose of them? Yeah, I, well said, Charles. I didn't get it at all. And in fact, it just distracted from the story. Yeah. Because I don't know. Okay, well, was I, that was supposed to be something? You know, did I miss something? Right. What's going on with that? So yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah. All right. So that's all the attention I think they deserve, really, personally. <laughs> Jesse washes his hands of it silently. That's it. All right. Um, all right. Let's move on. Topic number three. Let's talk about our big bads. Let's talk about the Cybermen. And then, then it's also, at the same time, let's talk about the Cryons. Because, um, you know, the, the kind of flip side to them, you know, they're the native race of Talos. And we're told that essentially the Cybermen took over their planet, drove them underground, and they just want their planet back. Yeah. And they want the Cybermen off Talos. And so they've been kind of like waging this little resistance against them, but obviously they need help, which is why they recruited Litton. So, so we know we talked a little bit about the Cybermen and their plan, um, but uh, do you have any more thoughts about the Cybermen in the story and then also the Cryons? So we've already talked about how they seemed un um, Cybermenish to yes. me. Yes. Um, I also they they did not come across very mincing this mm -hmm. time 
Um, I also I did not feel any emotion for the Cylons. Cryons. Cryons, yeah, not yes. Cylons. Like, you know, like cry- yeah. cryogenics. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, yes. the, that's the that's the gag. Yeah, yeah and um, there wasn't this. Um, I mean, I get that they were in a struggle, but it just, I didn't care about it. Yeah. Uh, I was, um, it. So you didn't feel bad that the Cybermen took over their planet? Well, I mean, I feel in intellectually, I feel bad. Okay. But, uh, but I didn't connect to. That's pretty heartless, man. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I didn't have any, I didn't have any empathy for the characters. For some reason, they, I didn't connect with them. And I don't know. Once again, I think that's just writing. I agree. There was not enough in there to emotional and there is that um we've seen it in plenty of classic and modern who's where you have a character that um ends up uh dying and you really are sad about losing that character and you're very you feel the tragedy of their loss i just didn't connect on this and 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 i don't like i said it it just I'll let you talk now. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, well, I got a question I want to ask you. So, so when the doctor gets essentially thrown in cold storage, yes, pun intended, right? Um, he gets locked in this room with Flast, who's this cryon that we for, we find out is their former leader. Yes. And apparently, um, she reveals that the Cybermen and you know t- their plan to. Uh, she tells the doctor about their plan to alter history so that Mondas Mondas doesn't get destroyed in 1986 in the Tenth Planet, um, and um, the, it's here that the doctor realizes that oh hey, the Time Lords are you know like they're manipulating me, they're using me as their agent, and he's not very happy about that because he hates being manipulated by the Time Lords. That's that's obviously a very Doctorish trait. Um, and you know, he, he gives, ends up giving Flask his sonic lance, not a sonic screwdriver, a sonic lance that he has. And it's so that she could heat up these, um, these potential explosives that, you know, that they're fine when they're, when in they're in this really refrigerated state, but you know, you raise the temperature, they become volatile and they explode. So Flask, um, is just at this point, she's kind of like giving it, throwing up her hands. And like, she's like, look, I just want the Cybermen off my planet. And if I can take some of them with me, all the better. So she kind of decides, well, hey, I'll stay and I'll heat up the explosive. You escape. And uh, I'll take out a few of these Cybermen because I can't leave this room anyway. So, so what did you make of her sacrifice? <sighs> That didn't resonate with you, with you at all. Sad to say, Charles. Yes. yes. Sad to say. Yes. <clears throat> that I no. did not connect that she was sacrificing. Yeah. Until you just said the story. Right. I was so unengaged with this. <laughs> I don't understand how the doctor. I, 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 and and I I think this is my error. This is not the writing. This okay. is my just not being keyed in okay. is, um, you know, the doctor just out of nowhere, oh my gosh, the Time Lords are manipulating me. I'm like, where did that come from? I, I did not I did not connect the dots how to get there, nor understood how the doctor got the dots. Well, well because he was talking, well, once he realized that the Cybermen were trying to alter history, Yes. he figured, he realizes, well, well, the Time Lords don't want history altered. Oh, crap. The Time Lords are making using me as their agent here. See, that does not – even you saying it that yeah, way yeah. does not go A equals – you know, A plus B equals C. I, I, but but remember, it's the, that, it's the doctor. Oh, I, I get and, that. And, he, and, he, and he's been manipulated by the Time Lords into trying to keep the web of time yeah. on track, you know. Mm-hmm. And so so if, I, if the Cybermen are – altering trying to alter the web of time mm-hmm. yeah um don't you you know maybe he would kind of connect the dots and go like oh you know this is the time lords trying to to because they don't want their all non-interference they'll let they'll let me do it so i'm gonna be dumb jesse yeah 
All right. So the the Time Lords manipulated the TARDIS to go there. They manipulated Lytton to be freaking the experience. I mean, I don't see the strings they're pulling behind the scenes. Well, they got the doctor. Him... Well, they got the doctor involved. How? Well, um, because of the the um, the signal, you know, that they ended up tracing back to Earth. Okay. So that came, the the like, signal from Earth yeah. came from Gallifrey or something or okay. you know whatever events they orchestrated. I don't know. Okay, but, that's you, right. you, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I didn't see my point. Well, I mean, that, I you, know, you know, it's just it's something that the doctor realizes. Okay. You know. So yes, it's a okay. kind of a jump. Okay. But okay. I mean, Make I get I get, I get, I get where you're coming from. Yeah. But but you know, the doctor being the doctor could probably see those connections where we might not see them. Or maybe (laughs) Doctor is just a little bit egotistical and is seeing um, strings where they aren't there. Maybe. Okay. Because it's not not confirmed either way. So this this could be just the Doctor's paranoia. I will grant you that. Yes. But um, the Doctor has been burned by the Time Lord so many times before that um, it's understandable he would feel that way oh i get that yeah and i just and i feel better because i was worried that well jesse it's clear yeah that this 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 is the reason why no it's okay, no sorry, it's, sorry. it's it's not sorry. that clear no it's not <laughs> okay, that clear okay, I, w- good. I, feel I will i will admit that it's not <laughs> as clear as it could have been absolutely but um that's the, you know the connection the doctor makes at least got it okay um so uh so um you know, we talked. We talked about the Cybermen, that big battle. Um, the one of the things that that kind of amuses me about the Cybermen in this story, in particular, is the Cyber Controller, who, um, needless to say, isn't. You know, he's played by played by. Um, I talked about this earlier, Michael Kilgariff, and he was one of the the original Cyber Controller in the Tomb of the Cybermen back in the day. So they bring this guy back to play the Cyber Controller again. My problem, though, great, great, okay, on its on the surface, but apparently the guy has put on some weight since <laughs> the Tomb of the Cybermen. So, so you have the Cyber Controller who looks a bit overweight to be a Cyberman, for one, and then they give him this horrible helmet which kind of looks like a cyber mohawk a little bit. You know, this big kind of cone-like um, centerpiece in his helmet. And I'm thinking, you know, just it's so hard to take the guy seriously. And it's, and it's one of those things, you know, you talk about how you get taken out of a story. Um, and it's just that, you know, that, that you, ta- you talked about how Colin Baker's costume took you out of the, takes you out of the story. Well, that's what kind of happens with me with the cyber controller. So I, I'm I googled the images. Yeah. To actually, and you're right. I mean, um, you know, what is the joke? I, I um, the Elvis after he discovered yes. carbohydrates. Yeah. Right. This is a Cyberman <laughs> after he discovered cyber carbohydrates. This is this is not young Elvis Cyberman. <laughs> no. This is like Elvis about to die on the toilet Cyberman. Yes, and um. um so just saying, and it is a bad helmet. Well, after after is, one too many peanut butter banana sandwiches. Yes. Yeah. And you're right with the mohawk looking there. It is not a good look. It's not a good all. look. No. Um, yeah. It's so like why doesn't he have the the standard? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The standard. I mean, yeah. Just I don't. It's so silly. I and mean, then you're like, I felt, I feel bad for the guy. He had to put on that that particular costume. Um, yeah. I have to know just what the hell was going through the designers' heads when they came up like, okay, we need to make him look distinguish him from the cyber leader. Okay, how about this? And you know, just it's. I mean, okay, it was the '80s. Fashion choices were not always the best then. Yes, but well, in this particular instance, this is. Uh, I think this is even farther out of bounds. And is this not? Um... We also, if I remember correct, there is um, – this is when budgets were being cut as well. Yes. Yeah, correct? Cause, so they yeah were... because I mean, 
the, the you know the Doctor Who budget, you know, which wasn't great to begin with back in the day in the classic era, um, right. trimmed even further. Like they were uh, filming on videotape by this point, mm-hmm. so as opposed to film. So yeah. um, the the so consequently the 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 show doesn't look as good, right. you know, because it's not being shot on film. So yeah. um, you know, just it, yeah, just you know, cuts cost were cost cuts were evident in various yeah. areas here, and mm-hmm. obviously, apparently, design was one of them because this is yes. such a bad design, in my right. opinion. All right, um, anything else about the Cybermen? Nope, 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 I am good. All right. Anything else about this episode? Any rants? Are there rants no, about- no. I mean, it it just um, and it isn't even one of those where I go, oh, I yeah. should go back and watch it. I I just didn't enjoy it enough that I don't care now. Yeah. Like if we decide, and I, I don't know why we ever would, but if we were like, okay, we're gonna go through one off season, we're gonna take one doctor, yeah. and go through all the episodes in a row, you right, know, right? Then we would, and and maybe we'd see some more in context, and maybe I would understand a little bit more about this. But um, you know, I I, I think that uh, Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant do the best they can, right? Um, I think that. Um, there, there are moments of the doctor and I, I've gotten a few quotes I wrote down that I thought were, showed his charm. Uh, but just overall, um, you know, and this is not because you had said, like we had talked, I had told you when we visited her earlier this week, like, Oh, I'm about three quarters finished, you know, watching both episodes. And you were like, yeah, it's not the best, is it? I'm like, okay, <laughs> good. It wasn't just me, you know. No. So that's good. No, I mean, I, I I knew that going in, and um, you know, it's just that this is one of the stories that we haven't covered. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I thought that you know, well, now we might we might as well talk about it anyway, because we absolutely because we 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 you know, like like I've I talked about with Christine is like that um here on the podcast that you know we. We we have to talk about the bad ones too, right? Absolutely. You know? Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about the good and bad of Doctor Who. Yes. And uh, this is one of the not as good ones. Let's just put it that way. Yes. All right. Um. All right. So let's move on. Favorite quotes. So I'm I'm going to get this wrong, and I I probably should let you do it because you know I'm horrible yeah. at pronouncing words. But um, Russell says, "Who are you?" Yes. And the doctor says, I've already told you, I'm known as the doctor. I'm also a time lord for the planet Gallifrey from the constellation of Castorborus. 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 Yeah. And Russell says, you're bonkers. And the doctor, that's debatable. Yeah, that's a great quote. That's a great quote. Uh, Any others you want to talk about? Um, I didn't want to take them all because they aren't that many. All right. right. Go ahead. Do you want to give one? Um, Let's see. I'll go with – the doctor uh, talk, talking to Perry early on in the story, uh, he says, The TARDIS, when working properly, is capable of many amazing things, not unlike myself. That was one of mine, so I'm glad we yes, did that. Not, no, uh, he says, not so um, uh, not so smugly, right? No, <laughs> yeah. very, very, not a lot of humbleness no, there. No, 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 no. Um, and then, so my last one is, Perry goes, will it believe you? And the doctor, if it doesn't, I shall beat it into submission with my charm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love this guy's arrogance. Yeah, that was good. Um, uh, Lytton, when he tells Griffiths, you know, Griffiths, when I look at you, I wonder why your ancestors bother, bothered to crawl out of the primordial slime. Yes, that was good. That's a good line. And then Flask with the doctor, uh, you are a time lord? And the doctor replies, Yes, and at the moment, a rather angry one. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Because that's all, great. As, as Colin Baker can only uh, um, yes. emote, and, as, and he, he, as he does so well. <laughs> he looks so young in this, too. Yes. You yeah. know, because we see um, and that curly hair yes. and that outfit. It's just crazy. Yeah, you know, he's obviously a... Yeah, a lot more younger and leaner, and yeah, just as it's a, it's definitely a different look. As um, uh, but uh, time is a, is a rather cruel mistress to us all. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, are, do uh, you want to give your review? I, I'll, uh, how about, first? I'll give my rating first. How's this? Okay, I will set the table. So, uh, like I said, I this is not one of my favorites. So, I give this one a six 
for the sixth doctor out of 10 overweight cyber controllers. <laughs> uh, we are in sync. All right. Uh, and uh, I, maybe somewhere Christine is happy yes. that we went this low. Well, she's uh, probably not happy that we didn't go below six. But Yeah, probably yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, I give it six out of ten pipe organs. Very nice. Very yes. nice. All right. So we are in sync. Well, that's good. Yes. All right. So if you want to cleanse our palates a little bit. Please. please. Um, so let's, let's do that. Everybody take a drink and then we'll wash the bad taste of this story out of our mouths. And uh, we'll reverse the reverse the polarity back or rather ahead, excuse me, ahead to 2011 with a story, a fun story, fun Cyberman story called Closing Time. If you remember that story, that was uh, the 12th episode from Series 6 in 2011, uh, written by Gareth Roberts, uh, who's a rather fun writer on Doctor Who. And this is... um, 200 years after the 11th Doctor left Amy and Rory in the God Complex, he goes on his own little farewell tour of friends, as he knows, before his death, depicted in The Impossible Astronaut. And one of the stops, he stops by and catches up with his buddy, Craig Owens, his former flatmate from The Lodger, and, you know, and uh, who's now living with his girlfriend, Sophie, and raising their baby, Alfie, a.k.a. Stormageddon, Dark Lord of All, which is one of the best names ever on Doctor Who. Absolutely. Um, love that name. The Doctor prepares to leave, but then notices a strange electrical disturbance in the area and decides to investigate. With Craig's help, the Doctor enters the department store after hours and catches a cyber mat, which has been siphoning off small amounts of energy for a spaceship. Uh, the Doctor also encounters a malfunctioning Cyberman in the building's basement. At Craig's house, while the two are distracted, the cyber mat reactivates and the doctor reprograms the unit to track down the cybermen signal. The doctor finds the spaceship actually sits below the store underground. So it's a little bit of an underground theme there in addition to the cybermen. uh, Accessed by a tunnel uh, from a changing room. The doctor is captured by the cybermen who tell him that their ship crashed long ago, but with new energy will soon have enough power to convert the human race. Craig follows the doctor into the tunnel and is also captured and placed into a conversion machine, kind of like Lytton was. And Alfie's cries over the closed circuit uh, television echo inside the ship. Craig, encouraged by the doctor, fights and reverses the conversion. The rest of the Cybermen painfully experience the emotions they have repressed from Craig's struggle and their circuits start to overload. The doctor and Craig escape via the teleporter as the ship explodes, the blast contained by the cavern. Saying goodbye, the doctor leaves in his TARDIS to face his quote-unquote death at Lake Silencio in Utah. So, yeah, so that's a, a that's much a nice... better, a much better story. Absolutely, that's a really nice one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and we haven't talked about that one for a while uh, in the reverse of polarity. So, um, so I recommend that one. Uh, it's a, it's a fun one. Uh, a lot of times we kind of overlook this one, so um, highly recommended. All right. So feedback, we got some feedback. You want me to do Holly? Yeah, if you, you do we, David. Yeah, okay, that sounds we'll, good. So right. we got Holly and David right in once again, and and thanks yes, to both of them for doing so. Absolutely. So Holly Mack says hi, Charles and Jesse. That's us, you know. Yay! An interesting episode with the Doctor trying to repair the Chameleon circuit, and Perry suggesting that they take a bit of rest, but the Doctor, being the Doctor, decides to soldier on. Turns out the doctor fixed the chameleon circuit. Or did he? It redecorates the outside of the TARDIS, and I don't like it very much. It really blends in. The Cybermen are interesting in this episode, but still deadly. The Cryons are an interesting nemesis of the Cybermen, also trying to figure out if the Cryons are telling the truth about the Cybermen plan to go back in time to prevent the destruction of Mondas and its ploy on the or if it's a ploy on the Cryon's part to get rid of the Cybermen. Side note, you do not want to know how many times Cryon autocorrected to Cylons in this email. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Love the Doctor's small grin when the TARDIS outside returns to normal blue box that we all know and love. I'll wrap it up here, Holly from Wisconsin. As always, thank you so much, Holly. And that was a really nice moment. Yeah, it's, you know, we always love getting Holly's emails and, um, I want to give a special shout out to Holly because she wished me happy birthday. So thank you, Holly, 
for yes. that. I did get your birthday greeting. And um, I'm guessing you're a Battlestar Galactica fan to have uh, Cylons show up so easily in your, uh, in your autocorrect. Absolutely. I nothing, love that. Nothing wrong with that because I'm a Battlestar fan myself. So Absolutely. I love me the BSG. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, David K. Proctor also writes in about Attack of the Cybermen. Um, he says, uh, I feel like I must have seen this a long time ago because I remember the crazy shape the TARDIS wanted to be. I think the chameleon circuit would be handy, but then we wouldn't be able to collect the, all the shapes. Of course, one could just put uh, random dollhouse furniture around and say they are the TARDIS. I didn't remember much about the episode beyond that beginning. I feel like I was overly critical and nitpicky on some details that stood out. I found that odd that there were two captured bobbies that don't talk and the, the, no conversation was attempted. Well, that, like I said, that was in uh, Resurrection of the Daleks when they first appeared. Uh, however, an undercover detective that couldn't shut up. Odd, I'm sure, that it never related more than to making TV, TV than the plot. The Bobbies were just extras. I liked having Cybermen that could be clearly understood when they spoke. Interestingly, when the Doctor was brought in to meet the Cyber Leader, the assistant seemed offended when the Doctor didn't show respect. This Cyberman's emotion inhibitor was clearly malfunctioning, which we've talked about. Indeed. Uh, being a child of the 80s, I enjoyed the views of London from then, but was not, but it was not Doctor Who to me. Bring on Telos, a quarry. That's more to like Doctor Who, right? Yeah, exactly. We need a Indeed. good old quarry um, for classic Who. Uh, did anyone else have a problem with the sewers being of a notoriously wet island city being stone dry? Not to mention with sufficient ambient lighting that no one needed a torch. <laughs> What the F is a sonic probe? Oh, a dagger. Wait, what? Well, it's a sonic lance, for one. Yes. But uh, it just so happened it happened to be used like a dagger. Yes. To uh, take out a Cyberman. Um, the fellows that were on Telos were in need of a cyber head. This made me think of handles from Matt Smith's days. Yeah, maybe I thought I sh- the same thing. Maybe I should have made a handles connection. I should have done uh, yes. the time of the doctor, I guess. Uh-huh. Uh, how is that computer guided cyborgs can't shoot straight? Must be silver stormtroopers. Well, you know, <laughs> actually, they nice. were stormtroopers, but they were converted, converted into cybermen. That's why. Right. Um, didn't know that, did you? Uh, the doctor was seen tapping his little cap pin for luck. Interesting. Yeah, that's one of Colin Baker's little um, mannerisms that he likes to do. Oh, okay. Whenever he gets into to a rough situation, you'll see him kind of stroke that cat badge a little bit. Okay. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that. Yep. Okay. So that's a six doctor trait. Uh, I do have it trouble with the insubordinate Cyberman and the TARDIS. He is commanded to destroy Perry, but then she screams and the doctor yells, wait. And the Cyberman stops without the order being rescinded. Unlikely. Right. But, you know, mm-hmm. got to get her out of that predicament somehow. Uh, does everybody w- know about regeneration? Seems like the Cybermen would you want to appropriate this skill. Well, I guess they kind of do in, yes. uh, you know, Ascension of the Cybermen and the Timeless Children, don't they? Yep, they do. Thanks to the Master. So um, points, you know, there, right? Uh, I don't get the cryons. They evolve on a planet where they cannot survive until they are sufficiently advanced to develop refrigeration. So many planets that we know of are below zero naturally. Mars is close, and all the ones further out have numerous frozen moons. Well, my theory around this is that their planet used to be more um, inhabitable to them, but because of the Cybermen, they're what they did, it raised the temperature of the planet, so they had to go underground. Fair enough. That's my theory, anyway. Okay. Um, that's my explanation for it. That's how I would explain it. Just saying. Uh, how about the doctor using cyber guns to kill Cybermen? Yeah, we talked about that. Uh, this was expedient, but not doctorish. Nope, not in the slightest. Uh, after all this, I still enjoy the episodes, especially the nods to William Hartnell's time, uh, seventy-six number 76, Totters Lane, and the destruction of Mondas. And he says, thanks, David K. Proctor. So thank you, David. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate it as always. Yep, and uh, glad you uh, had something to uh, that you enjoyed about the about the story. So that's good. So even in the bad Doctor Who stories, we can find something fun to talk about. Absolutely. All right, and if you want to be like Holly and David, and please do, um, please write to us. We'd love to hear from you. 
Uh, we know you're out there. We know you're listening. I know all the special guest companions are out there. So uh, you guys can write in too, you know. Um, just saying. So you drop us a line at nextstopeverywheresmg at gmail.com. It's Next Stop Everywhere SMG for Southgate Media Group at gmail.com. Or you write to us on the Twitter at Next Stop SMG on Twitter or on Facebook at Next Stop Everywhere the Doctor Who Podcast or Instagram at Next Stop Everywhere Podcast. And Jesse, how about you? Where can they reach you? Well, Charles, you can find me talking to you about the absolutely wonderful uh, CW and DC direct series Stargirl um, in the Phantom Zone podcast. Uh, we are breaking that down every week, and this is something, if you aren't watching it, go catch up. It is a really fun series. Uh, you can also, coming up soon, uh, toward the end of this month, we will be starting up Titan Talk again. Yay! Uh, talk about a regeneration, uh, where a reanimation, yep. uh, where we'll be talking Doom Patrol uh, uh, Season 2 on Titan Talk. Um, just just got this, a new trailer for that today. Yeah. I saw you tweeted that. Yep. Um, this week, as a special birthday celebration, Charles Skaggs is on Set Lusting Bruce, the Bruce Springsteen podcast that just dropped yesterday. If you have not listened to it, please go. It We had so much fun uh, kind of talking music, and uh, we always talk about Doctor Who and other fandom stuff, and it was just kind of fun. Though we did throw a little Doctor Who in there because we had to. Yes. Uh, no, it, is but it, was, it is us. It is us. It is. Yeah, so please check that. And, um, and then it's not just because Charles is on there every week. I'm joined by different uh, fans of Bruce Springsteen and other musicians from around the world talking about their music. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at Jesse Jackson DFW. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Charles, how about yourself? Well, as for myself, uh, you can reach me at Charles Skaggs on Twitter at Charles Skaggs on Instagram. Would definitely appreciate it if you liked and followed me there. Um, also, uh, Facebook, of course, at uh, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio. And my blog of geeky things. Do the thing. Hold on. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on Next Stop Everywhere. Doctor Who, Torchwood, The Sarah Jane Adventures, all kinds of comic book sci-fi goodness. Um... News of my other podcasts they do for Southgate Media, including the aforementioned The Fandom Zone podcast, where Jesse said we're having fun talking Stargirl. Um, that's on DC Universe and the CW right now. Um, and then uh, Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, where, like Jesse said, we're talking Doom Patrol Season 2 starting here in just a couple of weeks. So uh, be sure to come on back for that because we have a lot of fun talking Doom Patrol and it looks amazing as it did in this first season, judging by the trailer. So it's going to be a great season to talk Doom Patrol. So um, check us out over there. And then also Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast that I do with Zan Sprouse, whom you've heard here on Next Stop Everywhere and will again soon. So just teasing that right there. But uh, where we talk about all things, of course, Twin Peaks, David Lynch, all kinds of pop culture references and uh, all the references that you wouldn't hear her do on her new, um, uh, you know, that uh, Oscars Gold, uh, the podcast that she does with DJ Nick and um, and uh, Holly and uh, where they they talk uh, classic movies. But uh, you should check that out that podcast anyway, because it's really good. I enjoyed the first episode of that. So so cheers to you guys for doing that. Um, and then, uh, like Jesse said, I'm also on that his wonderful Set Lusting Bruce podcast, which uh, where we got to talk music. So if you're kind of looking for us to talk about something else uh, besides Doctor Who and comic book TV shows for a change, um, check it out, because we had a nice little discussion. And uh, I, I thought it turned out rather well. I thought we had a okay. call. It really did. It was really a lot of fun. So, and um, had a lot of fun. And thank you, Jesse, for having me on. And uh, thank you for um, uh, finally uh, uploading that on my birthday. So uh, I had a little bonus birthday treat. So everybody, um, thank you so much for listening. Um, but next time on Next Stop Everywhere, 
as we hit episode 189. Uh, we are going to talk a very important episode for Classic Who. We're talking survival next. The last story from the original series of Doctor Who, you know, from 1989 uh, and uh, the last story of the Sylvester McCoy's era, the last of the original era, uh, before obviously the Paul McGann TV movie in 1996. And so joining us for that is a very special guest companion, Zan Sprouse, returning once again to Next Stop Everywhere because, hey, she's a big Seventh Doctor and Ace fan. And who better? And even better, she's never seen the story before. Which, ah. which if she's a big Ace fan, how has she missed this particular story, right? So, yeah. um, so this should be a lot of fun to have two people that have not seen this story before now. Oh, this should be a lot of fun. And, yes. And um, it's, a, it's kind of a bittersweet because it is the last story from the original era, but it's a good one. And we get the return of the master and uh, in the final story. So um, everybody, please come on back. It's going to be a lot of fun. Come on back next time. Uh, Jesse, any final thoughts? No, uh, we're coming up on – uh, we got one more week of um classic who then we're kind of going back to the modern who yep. it's going to be a little it's going to be fun uh we appreciate everyone sticking around with us as we go through this um and just thank you as always charles and i hope you had a wonderful birthday week i did i did you know i got to spend it with Lori and my parents uh we just had a nice little dinner uh obviously with the coronavirus we we didn't make plans to go out to eat uh, right. because we don't want to catch the coronavirus. So, um, but uh, it was very nice. Had a nice steak dinner and uh, got a lot of cool Good. gifts and um, lots of great birthday wishes from everybody on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so everybody that wished sent those along, thank you so much for me. Uh, I really appreciated it. It brought a smile to my face. And, um, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to return the favor the kindness uh, when it's your birthday as well. So uh, everybody, thank you again and come on back next time for episode 189 survival. Zan Sprouse is back in the TARDIS and it's going to be a lot of fun and we'll see you next time right here on next stop everywhere. The doctor who podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.